Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Can uh, can everybody hear me okay? I don't know if uh, maybe just give me a thumbs up or uh, um, something in the chat box just to make sure that you can hear me okay before we get started. Um, okay, all right, good. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. I apologize for running a, a bit late here. Um, I do have to tell you that um, we may have a bit of an interruption uh, midway through this, which shouldn't be a recurring phenomenon. Uh, as I was just, as I entered the room today, I had realized I didn't have a room assignment um, for this particular class session, mostly because instructors were sort of free to do these real time wherever they want. If they, if they have the camera set up at home, they could do it at home or they could do it some other uh, place. But I just sort of prefer to do it in Smith Brasher here on main campus, which is where I have my office. But to, so I had a room request. I just got a different room assignment just as I was sitting here, and I have no idea whether the room I'm in right now is going to be reserved here between 12 and 1.15. If it is, uh, I'm going to basically say, okay, we're going to take a short break, and I'm going to go upstairs to the room that I'm actually assigned to. Uh, but I just thought I'd stay here since I already had everything set up, and we're good to go. And uh, if we do get kicked out, I apologize. It's one of those beginning of semester bits of uh, uh, minor chaos that uh, uh, does come up from time to time. So uh, anyway, bear with me on that if that does happen. It looks like we don't have everybody here yet um, attending. And uh, I sent out the link to this about an hour ago. And uh, it occurred to me that uh, I, know, uh, I got a couple of emails from students yesterday saying, hey, how do I get to the class? And I usually send the link sometime during the day um, and uh, of class, but uh, maybe I should going forward send that a bit earlier, particularly since there's no physical class to go to. This is all uh, conducted online once a week uh, in this uh, in the Zoom session. And it's going to be in Zoom always. The link I sent you probably should be the same link you'll use throughout the rest of the term. So if you want to bookmark that or something, that'll be good. Uh, it should be what you are able to use as we go forward. Okay. So um, I'm recording this today. I'm not usually supposed to record this because it's supposed to be a class that people attend. Uh, in real time, which is why it's called a real time online course. But uh, I know that there was at least one student that I just uh, in my office about you know, 30, 40 minutes ago just approved as a late overwrite into this section. And I'm sure that he has not yet gotten into uh, to this yet in order to attend. So uh, I'm going to post the link to this video in the Brightspace course site so that you'll have that. So that everybody will be on the same page uh, because we only meet once a week. And the rest of the activities are online in Brightspace. And so, uh, and I'll talk about the activities and what they're about. Uh, but I want to make sure we don't get too far ahead of, of people. Uh, this is an interesting class because it gives us, there's lots and lots of flexibility. This is a very much an introductory course in econ. And uh, we're going to touch, like all survey courses, we touch on a lot of different areas uh, without really getting too in-depth and, and, and overly detailed as to some of them. But I think you'll find it to be fairly interesting. I know that we got some pretty good reviews last time from uh, in the fall semester from students. And we cover a lot of things like poverty and the economics of crime, the economics of drugs, uh, all of those kinds of issues, things that you probably would not cover in a traditional macroeconomics class or micro. And so we're going to cover a lot of those particular areas. Uh, today, my main uh, purpose is really to just sort of explain what we're doing in class. And I'll, I'll try to uh, get into some of the slide uh, presentation as we go. Uh, first thing I want to do, uh, by the way, my name is Tim Simpson. You probably have that right now. Uh, and uh, I'll be an instructor. I've been teaching here for 17 years. I've been a uh, faculty member in econ for uh, going on 30. So I've been doing this a while. I've been teaching this particular course since, uh, well, I think really since about when I first began here. So. Uh, it's gone through some changes, and we have uh, tried to, to make this a bit of uh, an introduction to economics in general, uh, to make it a little bit more interesting than what people might think economics is supposed to be. We're, gonna, we're really going to focus on the social science aspects of this particular kind of discipline, and uh, uh, so that everyone can really understand what economics is about, because it really affects all of us. We are all economic beings. And so... As we get started here, I just wanted to sort of point out to you the, uh, uh, hopefully everyone can see this if you're looking at it and uh, try to widen us a little bit here. Maybe that's a little easier to see. So this is the main course site. 
in Brightspace. And uh, if you haven't logged into that yet, please do so. Um, you should have had access as of oh, Monday. And um, I'll try to darken this, try to bring the lights in a bit. Hopefully, you can see that a little bit better now. And um, so, this course is a little bit different. We have all kinds of different modalities of courses we have. For those who like uh, to attend classes in person, we have those. If people who like to do everything online, we have that. If people who like to view this stuff live from wherever they are, work, school, another town, wherever we have that as well. So uh, uh, this class works well for those who don't want to make it into campus. Uh, now, it is a class that you're going to want to attend from 12 to 115 every Thursday. There won't be a recording as we go forward. So. Uh, if you uh, don't get the notes from somebody, you might want to try to, uh, if, you don't, if, you don't, if you're not able to attend a class, you might want to try to get notes from somebody. And uh, there is an opportunity to get to meet each other. And I'll sort of go through the, uh, uh, the course site here so that you know uh, what's going on. So this is the main page here. I will usually post the link right there. So you know, just click on that. You can copy that link into your browser, maybe save that because it's going to be there. Uh, it's going to be there for for a while, I think. My introductory note there, and then this is my information. My office hours for this class are right after this class, and I'm going to be in the same building at room 201 in Smith Brasher. For those of you who are familiar with main campus, uh, if you uh, go to the Smith Brasher Hall, right up the stairs, and it's right on the right side there. All the faculty offices for the School of Business are there, so that's where you'll find me. Um, and in fact, on the syllabus itself, which I'm going to go over here in a minute, um, it's got all my office hours throughout the week, and they're all going to be in the same place in Smith Brash Room 201. So feel free to come by at any of those times if you want to meet with me. And if those times don't work, then just send me an email and say, hey, can I meet with you at 8 a.m. on Friday or whatever? Uh, and I'll probably be able to do something like that. Um, that's fine. Um, I probably won't be able to do a lot of traveling to something like the West Side campus or something like that. But uh, if you need to meet at a different time, we've never, I've never not been able to do that to find some time that's mutually agreeable. So uh, just let me know if you do want to get together and I'm more than happy to meet with you if you have questions, concerns, or, or whatever that you just want to uh, want to talk through. I'm, I'm available to uh, to do that, okay? Uh, we've got, okay, we've got some more attenders, and so that's good. So I'm just going to want to walk through a bit of what we're doing here. If you go to this, this if you go to coursework, that's really sort of your main, so you're familiar with Brightspace, and so bear with me because I know it's perhaps a bit repetitious, but for those who are new, it's, it bears uh, some, some, some discussion. If you go to coursework and then go to content, you'll see the very first tab here is the syllabus. And what I want to do is take a look at the syllabus here and go through it a bit. And uh, in fact, I think it might be easier for you to view I just download it and then just take a look at it from there. That might be an easier way to go through it. So let's uh, let's go through this a bit and um, I'll walk through it so that we know what's going on because this first day of class is a day is a class uh, time for getting organized. And uh, let me try to blow this up a little bit here. That might be easier for everyone to see if I'm able to do that. Where's my cursor? Okay, so that's that's probably pretty good. Okay, so um, this is course Econ 1110. That's the CRA number, and this is a RTOL real time online course 12 to 115. The fact you're here, you probably know that. That's my information there. If you want to contact me, email is probably the best way to reach me. Um, you can leave me a voicemail if you like, but it goes to, to my email. So uh, it's really the same thing. So uh, if you want to leave me a voicemail, that's if you're in your car and you can't write a, a voicemail or can't write an email, just Feel free to do that. It'll go through to my email. I'll, I'll just respond back to you. Uh, if you do want me to call you, leave a number. Um, the other thing, too, and I probably don't say this enough, is if you send me an email, just make sure I know what class you're in. Um, because sometimes people will say, hi, I'm, uh, uh, I wonder what we, what's our next exam or whatever. I don't know what class you're in. I've got five different sections. And so uh, just tell me that you're in Econ 1101 or whatever, um, or 1110, I guess. And uh, that way I'll, I'll know who you, who you are and what you're doing. These are my office hours for all, all my office hours, at least I think. There's going to be one that's going to be like 4.30 on Monday. Uh, and it's going to be in this room that I'm in right now, which is Smith Branch 104. But that's going to be a bit later in the semester. But uh, if you need to, to meet with me, feel free to. The text that supplies, this is something that there is no real text for this course, okay? 
This is not what the bookstore has on record. Now, some of you may have bought a textbook by McConnell. If you did, and you're able to take it back, I would say you can feel free to do that. Um, I don't know why that the text the, the bookstore keeps ordering that because um, I have not taught this course until last semester. I hadn't taught it in a while. We had another instructor doing it, and I don't. He was using a, a text that really, probably, frankly, was not the best selection because it's what we use for macroeconomics, which is a 200 level course. It's a different sort of text. We went ahead and used it last semester, but um, there's no real text. I am gonna give you all the material that we need in this class, both in terms of lecture material. I'll give you links to videos that are really interesting, I think. Um, so there is really no text and no reading on a weekly basis. I'm, I'm, I'll be supplying that content. One of the things about a survey course that's interesting gives, there is some flexibility in the sense that there are maybe a, 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 an occasion which we wanna simply talk about a current event, something big or happened economically. And uh, we'll have the flexibility to do that, even though I do have sort of an idea of where, we're, well, not sort of an idea, I have an idea of what I want to cover, but as you'll see from the syllabus and the schedule on that, that um, uh, there's some, some slack built in or some other kinds of content. And we may get, um, you know, we may get a delay. This is a spring, winter, say spring semester. There could be a time in which, uh, you know, we have a snow day, in which case, uh, you know, if we can't come, I have to come to campus to do this. And uh, if the campus is closed, which is maybe not so likely at 12, but it, you know, it does happen um, that we may be a little bit off schedule. It's not going to be a big deal with this course. Uh, and all the exams and all the quizzes will take place as scheduled. And I'll talk about those in a second. So there is no text for the course. I will give you, though, lots of uh, resources that you can use. And it's going to be really important to come to class and attend just so you can pay attention and learn what's going on and, uh, and also participate in the, uh, in the discussion activity. So some of this I'm gonna let you read on your own because it's fairly straightforward, but the course description talks about the, the issue of developing economic literacy. This is an, an issue because I, I think that a lot of us who teach economics have been sort of concerned for really forever that uh, econ is really not taught in high school. Um, and yes, I know there is an econ course that is taught in high school. And I, in fact, took a, a, a one semester econ course that really, in hindsight, wasn't very good, frankly. Um, and uh, maybe you were more fortunate than I was to have had a pretty good econ course, but I can say mine was not. And in fact, I knew very little about economics or finance or accounting or anything when I first uh, entered college. And yet, this is the area that I went into as a major. Uh, I knew how to write papers and knew history and all that. So really, I think that we have a deficiency in our society in, in terms of people's understanding of economics. And it's really unfortunate. It really, it's tragic, I think, in so many ways, because we are economic beings, all of us. Everything that we do economically has an impact on the broader economy because we are related to each other. We're, we, we supply labor, we, we, we uh, consume goods, we pay taxes, we do all these kinds of things, have all of these interactions with others. and so. Uh, we can't help but be economic beings. And so I think it's very unfortunate that a lot of people simply have a, a blind spot when it comes to economics. And I, I, we see this um, from time to time. I also uh, am a tax, uh, I'm a tax accountant. So this is the time of year we're getting ready to start. And it's, it's amazing how what people do not know about things that are very important to them that they should know. But uh, at least uh, for those who are enrolled here, you'll be much more. Uh, astute uh, when it comes to econ afterwards than you are now. And that's good. And you should be. That's what the whole purpose is, uh, is to learn. Okay. So we'll talk about the role of, of individuals and businesses. We'll get to that probably next week. I don't think we'll get to some of this uh, today. Um, we'll talk about the role of government as well. That is a recurring theme in economics. We're going to um, talk a bit later in the course about some of the major economic theories excuse me, that have been developed over time. And one of the um, factors that differentiate the two very broad schools of economic thinking from each other is really the role of government and where government fits in. Um, with some arguing that government should do less and should be as, le as less involved as possible in the economy, with others arguing that government should do more. Um, this is a pretty unbridgeable argument so uh, in some ways. And so as a result, those debates 
go on and we're going to sort of cover those. And, and we shouldn't also shy away from the fact that some of the things that we talk about in economics are fairly controversial in nature. I don't think there's really any way to sort of sugarcoat the idea that sometimes we'll talk about economic theories that <clears throat> you may just not like at all. You may just really think, oh my gosh, that's the worst, the dumbest idea I've ever, ever heard. Um, for instance, we will talk a bit about It'll be a few weeks, we will we'll take some time by design to talk about the history of economic thinking. How economic thinking has developed over time as really an outgrowth of industrialization and urbanization, where it became important to think about economics, about how we relate to each other from a, a material standpoint in terms of consuming and producing and buying and selling. And we'll, we'll talk about the work of Karl Marx, and, uh, and a lot of people just really don't like Marx at all. And, Frankly, he doesn't travel very well intellectually into the 21st century, um, but he had a, a great impact on economic thinking in general. And frankly, there are people who are still influenced by his work. And so I know it sort of never fails to, to get people riled up. And, uh, and that's not my purpose. It is just an effect of economics is that sometimes people, you know, we're, you're being exposed to things. And this is not, uh, we're not unique in the college experience uh, to ideas and theories which are uncomfortable. Okay, so, but we'll do it as a learning mechanism so you can prepare for yourself and contrast various ideas <clears throat> and thoughts about what we should do in economics, okay? Um, so I'll let you read all this on your own. Um, this is really important that you uh, attend class because it's only a once a week uh, attend uh, attending. However, you can also register your attendance by participating in the, uh, in the course activities, uh, which are primarily weekly discussions in the Brightspace uh, page, your attendance for this um, particular class, the Zoom session, is, is automatically captured in Zoom. So basically, I just down, it downloads to an Excel file. So if you are here, I've captured your attendance. Do me a favor, though. Make sure you, when you sign in to Zoom, you know, there's a place for your name. Just put your name there or some way that I can recognize you because sometimes people use, like, user IDs or whatever. Um, and, and I have no way of matching that up with who you are. Uh, so that's just a way of capturing that. That's the way that we capture your, your weekly attendance, that as well as uh, participation in Brightspace. Okay. Um, talks a bit about, you know, attendance and, and how you attend course and whatnot. And uh, I can refer you to, to that. So let's take a little bit of a look about what some of the major activities are going to be uh, <clears throat> in the class. We are, we'll have two exams, one sort of around mid-semester mid and then one at the very end. Neither one are considered comprehensive, and that is the first exam will only cover the material that we've covered from the beginning up until that point, and then the second exam will only cover the material since that first exam, and uh, so they're non-comprehensive in nature. There'll be six quizzes, and those will, and, oh, by the way, these will be in Brightspace, the exams and also the quizzes will be available in Brightspace. You'll be able to see them uh, either under the quizzes link where you go under in Brightspace. Let me just show you uh, under coursework. Let me just shrink this a minute here. <clears throat> I know some of you are familiar with this, and, but you know, for those who are not, it's, it's worth looking at. Um, if you go under coursework and content, you can find it. It'll be available in a week. Now, we don't have one this week, but it would be down here or you can do coursework in quizzes. And it's, there's nothing here yet, but there will be. That's just another way to get to it, okay? So, <clears throat> so those are the ways that you'll access them. And for the quizzes, you'll have an unlimited number of chances to take the quiz. It'll be available. For the, for the weeks that they're assigned, there'll be six uh, weeks that you'll have a quiz. In two weeks, there'll be uh, an, an exam. And then that's only eight weeks. The other seven weeks, there won't be any activities but the weekly discussion. And I'll talk about the discussions uh, here in a minute. The quizzes you can take as many times as you like, um, again and again and again. And uh, they're all there were 10 points each. So, um, well, I'm sorry, 25 points each. And so, if you want to, I had somebody about a year ago who took a quiz like 45 times, and uh, which you're free to do. I mean, that, that's probably a record, but feel free. I mean, I don't, there's no limit that I set. And, uh, if you want to just keep taking it again and again, you can. You'll have the entire week to do to do that. So the week starts, the class week starts on Monday, it's day one. Sunday is day seven. Okay, so Monday, day one, Sunday, day seven. And I'll talk about this week's participation because it's 
uh, this is the first day and we're kind of getting off to a bit of a, uh, well, just a slow start because we don't start until Thursday, but I'll get to that. Okay, so these are gonna be in Brightspace. The exams you'll have one opportunity to take, but you'll be given lots of time uh, to do it. You'll be able to take it wherever you like. You'll be able to use your, your notes, the internet, whatever you like, uh, whatever you prefer to use. You could do that. You'll be given ample time to do it. As we approach the exams, I'll talk more uh, about those. Let's talk about the, the, the discussion. So for this week, I know that I posted, um, in, I'll just show you in Brightspace, I posted a, a weekly discussion activity. And, and uh, I'll give you till next week to do this week's. Uh, just try to make sure not to get too far behind on this because you don't want to get behind anything in this class. I just got a little welcome note there, a little welcome thread. So go ahead if you want to put your name and you know all that. This is some boilerplate information. I didn't uh, develop these. I think you probably have seen these in other classes. And uh, if you just want to introduce yourself and maybe you'll know some somebody from some class somewhere, maybe you uh, know somebody anyway. So just feel free to check in there if you like and uh, introduce yourself. But that's not the, the main activity. It's this one right here, week one discussion. And it doesn't look like anyone's posted to it yet, um, which is fine because I was still building this uh, as of, I think, like Tuesday. I think it's all went up uh, like Tuesday. So if you can take this discussion into next week, that's fine. It's not going to be a serious business. You'll have week one and week two you'll need to do. I think you're going to you're, you're find it's not going to be overly onerous, but you do want to do them. So in the bowl will be what you're looking to address now, typically, you want to do this by day five of the week, okay, which is Friday, and, you'll have, and then you'll be required to make one additional post in reply to some other class member, even if it's me, okay, so you could just make a reply to somebody else sometime during the week. You can even do your reply comment even before you do your original uh, post that's due Friday, and the reason I make it Friday is because we, sometimes it'll, it'll be tailored to fit the material that we're going to be talking about in class that week. So maybe it would inform your discussion a little more to have heard a little bit about it before you make your post. So you got another day and a half or so to make that because it's until 11.59 p.m. on Friday. And then you can make a reply post at some other time or you can do it at the same time. That's that's fine, okay? And you just click on the hyperlink here and make your post. And there's, there's a, a link here to something called discussion guidelines. It goes into some detail as to what really is being expected on these discussions. And um, I would read that if I were you. I think it would help you in order to understand what the expectations are on discussions. I don't think these are unrealistic at all, um, but I talk about the fact that, that there are two major issues and some of those are with non-substantive posts. That is where people just sort of forget that they're making a post to an academic setting that should be related to the course content. Maybe they're replying to somebody else and they say, oh, you went to Manzano High School. So did I, and what year did you graduate? And then you, this kind of goes on and on and suddenly, oh yeah, I'm talking about uh, unemployment or whatever. And then maybe the last two sentences deal with unemployment. Um, so try not to make it too chatty. I don't, it's okay to, to do the thing, hey, I went to the same high school or whatever, but kind of, move beyond that and, and, and a good three sentences minimum that deal with the actual topic at hand. And, and I don't think you have to do much more than that. I know sometimes we get posts that go on like just forever and with references and in-text citations, you don't have to do that. You don't have to quote anybody. And I wouldn't actually, because you know I wouldn't want to risk not properly citing it, but I'm not looking for citations and references. This is not a a research course. This is more your take on the material as you as you see it. This first week is, is, is a pretty generic question. It's about what do you think is the most most pressing economic problem right now? Just because you're living in a world, you have an idea what's going on. There's inflation is going on right now. There's un unemployment's not such a problem, but it may be if we slide into recession. So it's not because we haven't really gotten anything yet. It's a pretty generic topic, but it will be more focused as we go forward. Okay. So that's one issue. The other is that uh, uh, people tend to get off, off track a little bit. So either they're not substantive or, or they're too brief or they, they kind of get off topic. So, so and I, I would, would urge you to stay away from quotes. I, I think it's really not necessary. You don't have to go on too long. Um, I mean, if you want to do a couple paragraphs, that's fine. I mean, you're not going to be penalized as long as you are 
more or less on topic, but I definitely would not uh, want you to spend too much time on these. And the same goes with the reply note. A good three sentences dealing with the content. There's a questions link here if you have questions for me that you'd like to just ask about and something you think everyone else would benefit from. Feel free to post it here in the Brightspace uh, site. Uh, I, the only thing I would say about that is if it's something that is of a confidential nature, like something you have to do with, you know, your own assignments or scores or makeups or something like that, then I wouldn't post it there. And, and if you do, I'll just reply by email. And the only email that I've got uh, for you is your CNN email address. So uh, everyone's got a CNN email address. If you don't use that email very much, you probably should because it's a good way for instructors, particularly in the online setting, to communicate with people, particularly uh, when it comes to things like, uh, you know, things that are, that are unique to your own situation that don't need to be shared other, uh, with everyone else. So, so sometime between now and the end of next week, post of this economic life discussion. It's a pretty generic question. Um, and there's, whoop, my cursor is going crazy here. There is no right answer to this. Um, so I wouldn't worry about, you know, you know, maybe making a mistake. Just tell them, what do you think are the most pressing issues right now? I gave some examples, economic growth, inequality. We're going to, we're going to get to this issue of inequality of income and wealth in particular a bit later. We're going to talk about uh, the global climate situation, healthcare. We're going to talk about all of these things. But you may have something different in mind. You may think it's uh, the issues with unionization, uh, you know, labor unions. Uh, from good or ill, and that, 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 could, that may come up. So, so that's the discussion uh, requirement. Um, those are with 10 points each or 150 points all together. And so you wanna make sure that you uh, participate and pl please do participate because I know that sometimes uh, people will forget that there is a discussion activity. So just make a note to do this every, at least every Friday and then make a couple of posts, one that's your own original contribution and, and reply to somebody else, but just make sure it's more or less substantive. And this is the way that these are graded. If you post anything after Friday, you, you'll lose a point per day. And um, so you wanna make sure that you do it. Midnight Friday, it's actually 11.59 PM, day five being Friday and uh, with one point deducted. Now there's no makeup opportunity on discussions, mostly because of the fact it doesn't make sense that there would be makeups. It's intended to be a participative sort of learning situation where you're communicating with others and sharing ideas. And once a week is ended, it's very likely nobody will ever go in and see anything you posted if you do it as a makeup. And so what is really the point of, of that? And so uh, there are, however, makeup opportunities available for the quizzes and exams. And you'll have a week to take those if you have missed it for whatever reason. And it doesn't really make any difference what reason you missed a quiz or an exam. Just send me an email saying, hey, I need to make it up. But you've got to do it within a week. Uh, that's your window because I like to open those back up to everybody so they can see both the question and the correct answer. And I really can't do that if there are makeups pending. So I think a week is a fair um, makeup period. And make, uh, that'd be the Sunday after the, the Sunday due date. These will always be due uh, by Sunday. And there's a 10% late assessment, which is really sort of a, a fairness issue. Uh, so those who do, did take it, you know, uh, and this is also sort of discourage you from doing makeups. Um, now, obviously, things happen, and uh, you know we could have some technical issues on our end that may be uh, impactful. So I don't foresee that happening, but you know who knows? It could happen. Uh, but for the most part, the exams and quizzes will always be due on a Sunday. The exams will probably be due like I'll probably make those available like right after class on the Thursday. So we get out of here at one fifteen. They'll be available through Sunday. So you'll have all day, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and all day Sunday. It gives you a pretty good window. The quizzes will go up on Monday of the week. So you'll have seven days in order to complete those. And again, the quizzes, you can work as many times as you like. The system will take your highest grade and it will fall. You'll get your automatic scores on exams and quizzes. They'll be auto graded. So you should know exactly how, how well you did. You just won't see what you missed. And Sometimes people say, well, how do I know? If I want to take it again, how do I know what I missed? And it's like, well, there's got to be some kind of trade-off. I mean, um, you know, you, you think back to what you, if you didn't know an answer to something you sort of were guessing, then that should tell you maybe that was one of the ones that you did, you did miss. I mean, that, there is, there's got to be some sort of trade-off where you uh, are actually looking into what you, 
weren't comfortable with uh, the first time around. So, or the second or third or whatever, okay? Um, so the quizzes and exams will be auto-graded. The discussions, I'll probably try to get those back to you within about a week or so after you've completed those. And I'll give you both qualitative and quantitative data. I'll give you points, 10 points possible maximum. And, uh, and I'll also give you some written feedback as well. So uh, if you're unable to access that, let me know and I'll be sure to, to, to let you know how to get that sort of feedback. There's a lot of information here, some of which is maybe applicable, maybe not applicable, but um, you know, uh, I'll let you read that on your own. Some of it's basically sort of boilerplate language. And so you can uh, look at that on your on your own. I do want to sort of talk a bit about the discussion or the, uh, the schedule here. So this is a 15 week or a full term uh, course. So we've got quite a lot of time to go over some of the material that uh, uh, is, is needed. This week, uh, week one is mostly just an introduction to the class as well as to economics in general. Um, and we'll talk a bit about, here after I'm done talking about the course, I'll talk a bit about some of the content that we'll be uh, discussing throughout the course itself. As we get going the next week, we'll have our first quiz next week. You'll see that available on Monday when you log in and you can take that whenever up until Sunday uh, next week. And plus, a week one discussion, I'll let you take that into week two, but notice you've got, if you do wait, you'll have two discussions to make. But you know, I, there's no, the only reason I'm doing this is because number one, um, not everyone is here because they're not all registered. I've got at least, I think there are two people. I know at least one is, is going to be brand new and has not yet had a chance to be input into the system. And so uh, I don't want to disadvantage anybody just because they signed up late. And sometimes people get dropped for all kinds of reasons financial aid as a glitch or whatever, you know, that sort of thing. So it's, it's fine. If you want to register, if you're registering late, that's fine. You, know, you have just a little bit of catch up to do, but it's not, not a lot, not much at all. Okay, so next week we do have our first quiz that'll be available. We have a discussion. Uh, notice these sort of skip weeks. And so about every other week or so, we have either a quiz or an exam due. We're going to be talking about things like next week, we're going to get into economic actors. That is, who does what? Um, we'll talk about the actor groups what their motivations are and who is who. So uh, the first couple of weeks will be doing the who, what, when, where, why of economics, that is who's who and what's what and, how's, and, and who's doing what and why. And so that's gonna be what we talk about. Week three, we'll get to demand and supply, which are pretty basic building blocks of economics. And so we'll get to that. We're gonna have a brief introduction week four about the role of government and the economy. And then we're gonna sort of circle back to that later because I wanna sort of build some economic theory so that as we come back to, we're gonna be talking about specifics uh, of this a bit later in the class, but this is just sort of to lay out for you what government, uh, what government's role is in the economy. Because it's got, the government's got a lot of roles to play from a big picture standpoint in terms of things like taxes and setting of interest rates and controlling the money supply, uh, down to things like taxation of individual goods like gasoline and cigarettes and things like that. So there are a lot of things that government uh, does, both at the federal and state and even local levels that we're gonna talk about that I'll, I'll come back to once we have a bit more detail. And then we're gonna get into about a, about a month long uh, schedule uh, talking about some of the economic theory that's developed over time, some of the economic thinking that has come up over time. For those of you who may major in econ at some point, and I know it's not uh, uh, the most common major, but it is a good major. Um, you might see a class at around the 400 level called economic thought that deals with this in a lot more detail where you'll really bore into the work of Smith and Ricardo, for instance, very early British economists who had a lot to say about how markets work, and how government should operate um, within the economy. And so we'll talk about Smith and Ricardo and all of this. And I know that we're gonna be cutting out some big names here uh, that we won't be talking about uh, but I, I may come back, I may talk about them at, at various times, John Stuart Mill, Jeremy Bentham, piece, people like that. But for the most part, we're going to be focusing on these in this particular section. We'll talk about Marx and Engels, also early economic thinkers that really are associated with the, uh, the worldview as related to labor, particularly in the industrial context and uh, in, in the capitalist system. Obviously, Marx was quite the critic. and. Um, or, and, and basically advocated a reversal of the capitalist system and some sort of 
reversion to ownership by labor. Um, you know, his, late, his work is a little bit problematic from a, a modern day view. It doesn't really carry very well. But some of the observations, I think, are really pretty interesting. And I think you, you might find um, some of his work to be interesting. Uh, and even Engel's work is, uh, he did some work on, on gender. And really, one of the very first uh, people in the social sciences to talk about gender roles and from an economic standpoint that uh, really nobody was talking about. And this was in the 1800s. And so uh, in that respect, uh, maybe a little bit ahead of his time. And I think you might find it to be interesting, even if you don't. Uh, are not on, on board with all those ideas. And that's, that's fine. We are not trying to indoctrinate you in any one set of theories, to, rather to expose you and let you form your own ideas. We'll get into some of the modern thinkers. We'll talk about a guy named John Maynard Keynes, who really was sort of the father of what we think of today as macroeconomics, and that's the big picture view of the economy. Um, he sort of revolutionized the way that people looked at the macroeconomy. We're going to talk about his work. He really is a very significant thinker <clears throat> and, and his work sort of, uh, we sort of call his, he and his followers uh, as the Keynesian school. <coughs> and then um, the opposing view is something called the classical school, which we'll talk about the following week. And, uh, and we'll talk about a number of different theorists who sort of fit into that uh, category, okay? So that's where we plan to go with that particular bit of economic thinking. Any questions so far about anything I've talked about? Okay, well, um, if you do, feel free. Um, you, we're a small enough group that I don't think we're going to be, I don't think we're going to get a, a cacophony of voices. And so uh, hopefully we won't be interrupted in this class, but if we are, um, I think we're probably far enough that one will probably end our class session. But I don't think anybody, if somebody's coming in one, I guess we'll find out. So, and again, that won't be a recurring issue. Um, then we're going to sort of circle back to government. We'll talk more about government, particularly in terms of the two major um, functions of government from a big picture standpoint, fiscal or what we call budget policy and monetary policy, dealing with the supply of money and the availability of credit. And then we'll get into some more, uh, we'll get into some current events that I think people find eye-opening, maybe a little bit... Um, uh, maybe a, depress, a bit depressing. We talk about things like population growth, income and wealth distribution. Um, these sort of go hand in hand, these two particular areas. In fact, I've deliberately sort of designed the flow of these so that one sort of leads to the other. Uh, by the way, one of the early thinkers we're going to talk about, Malthus, was very much fixated on the, the question of population and what it meant. His, his fear was that the population really worldwide would outgrow the food supply. And so we'd have massive starvation or whatnot. And it turns out it didn't happen, mostly because producers of food got much better at producing. And so as a result, we've been able to accommodate a much, much larger population, both worldwide as well as in the industrial world, which was really the context he was writing about. So he was, was fearful of that. But nonetheless, we still have issues with regard to population because the world's population continues to grow, grow, grow all the time. And, the question is, what's the outer limit? What are the resources that can sustain a, a certain level of population? We'll talk about what some of the projections are because I know that, that some of the international agencies that, that examine and work with these issues have projected that, that the growth is going to sort of tail off a bit. So sometime around mid-century, around maybe 9 billion people. Um, who knows if that happens? Uh, you know, we hopefully, uh, you know, the population doesn't grow as exponentially as what it has. But we'll talk about why, and we'll talk about the growth just in the last 200 years. It's just been uh, sort of parabolic, just the increase in global population. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll probably, well, we won't probably, we'll attribute it primarily to industrialization and the fact that we are able to mass produce goods and, and sustain a much larger population than what previously was the case throughout all of human history prior to industrialization, okay? We'll talk about wealth, income and wealth distribution, which are very much definitely related to that. We'll give some figures and stats and all that that are, are very current information. Economics of pollution, which deals a lot with the environment and uh, what's happening with the current state of pollution, what the role of government is. We'll talk about from the standpoint of economics of pollution and uh, what the costs of pollution are. And, uh, and, and the same goes the economics of crime. I, students really, I think, kind of like this particular discussion because 
we're going to focus not so much on the criminal conduct, but rather the economic effects of that, that conduct and what to do about it. And we'll, we'll talk about the work of an economist named Gary Becker, who advocated um, charging economic penalties to those convicted of, of nonviolent, but you know, but nonetheless serious crimes and make people pay for the crimes that they committed. Um, that would be much more effective than even incarcerating them because he observed that there are some people who don't mind being locked up, which uh, uh, I, I can tell you that would not be me. I think I would freak out being locked up, but uh, uh, these were his observations. And so we'll get to that a bit uh, through as we go. You can see the quiz and exam schedule there, and you can look at that. One thing I'll tell you is that those, those are pretty hard and fast dates for the quizzes and exams. And so even if we have a weather-related event or something comes up or we're just simply running behind uh, the schedule, we'll still have those and we just won't cover on that quiz or exam anything that wasn't covered in class. So I wanna make sure that, that we do get to that. Now the quizzes I'll probably create before the, uh, the, for the week that we're doing it. So I may not know whether or not we have snow on the Thursday class. And so I'll probably just make some allowance for that. So maybe I'm gonna talk about, uh, I don't know, government, economy, and I'll post this available before uh, January 30th. Well, it could be that on, on, the, on the class day, which is February 2nd, we have nine inches of snow and so the campus is closed. Well, I'll probably just make some sort of allowance for that. So uh, you're not gonna be penalized for anything that you haven't, uh, haven't been exposed to, okay? All right, well, questions about any of that. Hopefully, I have covered all the, uh, the major topics of interest here. And um, I'm just trying to find my cursor here. I don't know what, what's going on here with my. I'm going to try to shrink this, and I'm going to go and I'm going to talk about some of the, the course content here. And um, my cursor, I think my mouse is not working. I think that's part of my problem here. My mouse is just sort of. Uh, Stop working on me. There we go. No, uh, here we go. There we go. Good lord. You got way off of track. Hello. Do you, have, do you have class here? Oh, no. I was going to, I didn't check the quiz because I was going to complete it. Oh, that's fine. You can do that. Yeah. I'm, I'm just doing a, a Zoom class. So. Okay. I was hoping there's nobody uh, coming in this class. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's no problem. Okay, um, so any questions for me about anything so far that we've been talking about? That was uh, a lady who's going to clean the, uh, the room here. I, uh, I keep worrying about us being kicked out of this room. I am uh, I am poaching this room, but I'll be in a different place next time. So this wouldn't be a recurring issue. So, um, all right, let me just spend a few minutes. And uh, th there's a PowerPoint package that's in your um, Brightspace site. Just go to the week. And I probably should have mentioned this, but if you go to coursework and content, you'll have, there'll be a weekly, it'll be a rundown here every week in the class, weeks one through 15 will be there. By the way, this bright wave course materials, this relates to the textbook that it just, it just defaulted to this course. It's a textbook that we're not using. So uh, just sort of disregard that. I was, I tried to delete that. I was unable to, but just know that that's what's going on. Uh, if you click on this, will tell what we're doing that particular week. Uh, there's a little checklist if you want to sort of print it off and just keep track of where we are. And then there's also a PowerPoint presentation, which is just uh, sort of our way and your way of following along with where we are uh, in the course. And so this is a pretty good area here. And I'll probably have to update this. I know sometimes instructors will put all weeks ahead of time in there. Uh, I would sort of prefer not to do that just because if we get off schedule for whatever reason, I don't want to get too, uh, I don't want to get these out of kilter. I want everybody to know that if we're in week three, this is what we're going to cover. Maybe we don't get through everything, but we are primarily focused on that. So I don't want to get too, uh, too out of whack. So anyway, let's talk about uh, what's going on here. I just want to cover some introductory content. And if you have questions, feel free to, uh, to shout out. So all right, so I'm gonna, I mentioned at the outset here that, um, that not everybody has had econ before. And if you have, if you're like me, and if you took it in high school, you probably found it to be, eh, maybe not good, the same experience as what we are going to have here. So I'm gonna start from the beginning and assume that, that uh, uh, we need to describe everything about economics. And so we'll start with the question, 
What is economics? It's pretty basic, right? What is economics? And the answer is, this is a sort of a textbook uh, answer, but it's nonetheless a good one. That is it's social science dealing with choices made under conditions of scarcity and uncertainty. And I want to sort of hone in here a little bit on this, this definition and talk about the fact that this is very much a social science and we're going to sort of approach this class from that particular standpoint that it is very much a social science dealing with what? Dealing with people and the, the, the way that people behave from an economic standpoint primarily. Uh, there will be some overlap that you'll see with some other disciplines. And in fact, in the area of this economic social science that is becoming very popular is something called behavioral economics, which is sort of the intersection of economics and psychology. And if we have some time, uh, maybe toward the end of the class, because I did build a couple of weeks in without any specific topics so that we could cover some things with, uh, it's built in flexibility. I wasn't running out of ideas, just that I wanted to build in flexibility. We may get into some of the behavioral economics aspect because people do find that to be very interesting. I do know that uh, at CNM, the, the major of psychology is becoming very popular. So uh, I, I don't claim to be a psychologist, but uh, that is the area that is important uh, in terms of its interaction with econ. And one of the things about a social science like econ, as, as quantitative as we are, and I think we're probably the most quantitative of the social sciences, uh, you know, political science may rival us a bit, but I don't think, I don't think they're quite there. But uh, the thing that we should know is the fact that we've got very few laws in economics, unlike chemistry and physics, where there's a law, the law of gravity is gonna be the law of gravity today, next week, it's gonna be the same on Mars. I mean, it's gonna always be the same, it's, it's constant. But we really don't have that in economics. We have a law of demand and we have a law of supply. And even there, as we see, we'll see in a couple of weeks that there are goods for which the law of demand doesn't really hold up. They don't apply. Not very many goods, but there are a few. So even that one of the two laws, the only laws we've got, is really kind of squishy in that regard. So it's because of the fact that as people, we are not as predictable as the, the moon and the stars and all that. We, we make decisions sometimes based upon uncertain information. And this is really important for what we're doing in this class. We make choices sometimes dealing with when we're uncertain about what it is that we're doing. And it's, it's an interesting, but yet uh, relevant phenomenon in economics. And sometimes we're dealing with uncertainty. And that is like in the, in the realm of macroeconomics, which deals with management of the economy from a big picture standpoint, one of the metaphors that's long been used is this idea of driving a car by looking in the rear view mirror. That is, we really don't know what's coming. We, nobody really can tell the future. Anybody who says that they can tell the future has really got to be looked at skeptically, frankly. I, I think you do. Um, we are all oftentimes surprised by what happens. Uh, and it's because we don't have information. And the whole rear view mirror thing is the fact that the information that we're using in economics is all historical. There is nothing that tells us exactly what's going to happen in the future. Even though, as economists, we're often tasked with making forecasts. And that is part of our job, but we're not saying that we absolutely guarantee you that the, the inflation rate is going to be this next month. Uh, it's what we think is going to happen based upon our observations and our measurements. So uncertainty is a big aspect of this. And we do things a lot of times with imperfect information. And uh, if we have time toward the end of the semester, we'll talk a bit more about this idea of information uncertainty and, and how it really distorts markets, frankly. Um, if you consider the fact that I want to buy a used car, right, from you, you've got a used car, you want to sell, you want to sell it to me, uh, you might be tempted if you uh, are unscrupulous to conceal from me the fact that it's been wrecked or uh, that it makes a, makes a shimmy if you get over 60 miles an hour or something like that. Uh, you prefer I not learn that information, right? Uh, but I would need to know that if I'm wanting to make an intelligent decision. So uncertainty is one of those aspects. It's what we call asymmetric information. But also we're dealing, thank you, we're also dealing with scarcity. And that's really more relevant to sort of the overall concept of economics. Scarcity is, is everywhere. We, we are faced with scarcity. It's, it is inherent in the human condition. And in fact, I would dare say that if there were no scarcity, we probably wouldn't have anything like a discipline of economics. What would be the point? If everything that we wanted were available to us, 
like in Star Trek, where they walk into their quarters and they walk into the computer and say, "Ice tea, boom! Ice tea just appears," and or lobster, you know, thermidor, or whatever, and just sort of shows up. Uh, if everything were that easy, then I don't think we'd have to worry about scarcity and what to do about things. But we do have scarcity: scarcity of natural resources, scarcity of time. Somebody mentioned in my class yesterday scarcity of labor, which is, is particularly relevant at the moment. And uh, I think probably a year ago, uh, I don't know that's, that people would have said we have a labor shortage, but we definitely do. We definitely have a labor shortage, which is why our unemployment rate is so very low and why entry level wages in some positions are, are going way up. And it's relatively easy to find a job right now. Um, six months from now, that might not be the case. Jobs may be much more scarce. So scarcity is something that comes and goes, and we can't always hang our hat on things being there. Um, in smaller economies that are much more dependent upon crops, particular kinds of crops in particular, they could really be wiped out, and their economy could be really devastated by a bad crop. Uh, so Brazil relies a lot on sugar, and if the sugar crop is bad that year, due to excessive rain or drought, um, it's bad news for that economy. Uh, we're big enough that, that that may not impact us, if any, Single crop goes down, or even if uh, drought or floods impact us, but there are a lot of economies in which that could happen. So scarcity of all kinds of things, okay? But let's talk about sort of a, let's get a little bit more concrete with our definition of scarcity here. And uh, if we were to give a definition, that would be pretty rigorous. What would that be? Well, I pulled this from the, the dictionary itself, so I didn't have to go very far here. I did cite my source, and so this comes from Webster's, where it's the quality or state of something being scarce, the want or provisions of life. And uh, I like the second definition a bit better because it sort of matches and, and uses economic terminology. It's sufficient in quantity or number to compare with the demand. In other words, if the supply of something is insufficient in relation to the demand, then that's inherently scarce. That's a condition of scarcity. And so as a result, we have to deal with the issue of scarcity. At the moment, we've got a labor shortage. A lot of companies are trying to hire people desperately. Uh, and, uh, and I know I've been saying to students for a while that if you're looking for a job, you really want to nail something down. You might want to get on that before you know, the economy begins to slow down because I think we're already starting to see some layoffs among big firms. And I do think that'll work its way through the economy. And so right now, there's, no, there's a lot of plentiful abundance of jobs. You might not find that in about a year from now, or less, probably less, actually, because I do think that we are probably headed for a recession when there's a downturn in the economy. Uh, so that would be a scarcity of jobs, but there's a scarcity of a lot of things. And so scarcity is, in fact, the human condition. There's always scarcity of something, even if it's time, by the way. Even if it's time, uh, we have an infinite, we don't, it's not infinite. We know that we've got a limitation. We don't know how long we're all going to be here, but uh, we know that we've got a limited amount of time. And, and uh, uh, I can tell you, as somebody who's been around probably longer than most of you, I think time just goes flying by uh, as you get as the older you get. So uh, that is an issue of scarcity. Okay. Then this leads us into something called the economizing problem. So this is something you want to know about. This is essentially defined as the conflict between the unlimited wants of society and the reality of scarce resources. And so uh, a couple of things about this, this economizing problem. First of all, it's the, it's the issue of the word conflict. And one of the things that I should mention at the outset here, um, as we start to kick off this course, is the idea that conflict is something that is also inherent in economics. And that is that we always are faced with the situation where somebody wants to buy something and somebody wants to sell something. Okay, pretty basic transaction goes on billions of times a day worldwide. But the seller wants a high price and the buyer wants a low price. And, uh, and, and we don't really have a society in which we haggle over the price of too many things. And so it's a conflict. If you don't like the price, it may be no deal, but that's, but that's a conflict, isn't it? Because the seller wants something different than what the buyer wants. That's an inherent setup for conflict. And I don't mean conflict like a violent, you know, confrontation or whatnot, uh, some sort of smackdown. It's it's really just the idea there are opposing forces. In this case, um, and we'll talk plenty about these opposing forces uh, throughout economics, and certainly Marx 
when we get into him, he talked a lot about these ideas of put forces pushing against each other. And he drew a lot from philosophy on that. Here, we're simply talking about the fact that society generally wants, has an unlimited set of wants, and yet bumps up against the reality, which is a reality of scarce resources. And that is the idea that we want, 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 want. And it is believed, at least, that our wants are unlimited. Now, you may feel something differently about that idea of unlimited wants. And in fact, there is occasionally people do sort of push back against the idea that our wants are truly unlimited, that they've got no bounds, that we want, want, want. And um, but yet I think that's a pretty good way of, of viewing human nature, because if you just look at something like uh, healthcare, for instance, and, and medicine and, and medical cures, we solve one particular problem and we don't stop solving problems, we go on to the next thing, right? Um, I think the March of Dimes was set up to deal, I think the polio, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong about that, but, uh, but whatever the original intent was of raising funds from people uh, was eventually solved, but they still exist because they're trying to deal with other things. And so as a result, it's the idea that we are, our, our wants are thought to be unlimited. And if you disagree with that, well then, you know, you'll feel free to disagree with it, but nonetheless, it is part of what is theorized as being what's called the economizing problem in economics. And it is the central issue of why we have econ in the first place. I wanna also talk about something that is this issue of wants versus needs. And the question is, have we truly satisfied our society's needs? And are we mostly dealing with our wants now when it comes to our production and consumption of goods and services? And that is, um, you know, what, what are we mostly engaged in producing and consuming? Needs or wants? And, and I guess we could probably be clear about what are needs and we may disagree on what exactly are needs, but I think things like food and clothing, even things like medical care, I think most of us would agree are needs uh, and then everything else is a want. I think the answer to this question from an industrial uh, standpoint, an industrialized country's standpoint, is the idea that we're probably producing more wants than needs because every year that goes by, we produce as a percentage of total output, a lesser and lesser percentage of very basic things like food and clothing and even things like housing. In fact, we really don't have enough housing. And so that, that may be a need that we haven't quite yet covered. But for the most part, it's the, the production of wants is really where we're, we are. We produce a lot of things like electronics and cell phones and entertainment products. And, uh, all kinds of and things like travel. And, uh, uh, and it's difficult to sort of sort out what is want versus need. But I think it's safe to say that for the most part, with the possible exception of healthcare, where we don't have everything figured out yet, and we don't really have that organized of a system, at least in this country, of financing healthcare. Delivering healthcare, we do, we have that sort of down. But the financing of it is, it's not the same as where it is elsewhere. We'll get to that a bit later. Uh, but for the most part, we've gotten our needs mostly met and we're now on the ones. Now, this will be a, an equation we're gonna flip around when we talk about the lesser developed part of the world, what we call LDCs or lesser developed countries, because they are in a different situation entirely. They are in a position where their needs are not being satisfied. And there's something like 40% of the world's population doesn't have access to clean water on a regular basis. That's a pretty shocking statistic, uh, but some of you may be aware of these poverty statistics and whatnot, but it's a large percentage of the, of the world that does not, that make, forget about wants, it's about, <coughs> excuse me, satisfying needs, and they're not quite there yet. <laughs> so we're gonna talk plenty about that and what the implications are of that. All right, questions about anything so far? Okay, so that's the economizing problem. Um, so what is a solution or the solution, I guess, to the economizing problem? We're gonna make the case that it's the free market system, the free market system. And um, and we say, when we say free market, I think we're being deliberate, or I guess I'm being deliberate in talking about this idea of a free economy where people are free to enter, industries as sellers and free to enter transactions as buyers and that we 
are mostly free to choose. And we are certainly going to talk quite a lot about the work of the economist Milton Friedman. Friedman's been gone for a while, but his, he was very prominent uh, well, several decades ago and, and has got many adherents today. Many people still adhere to his thinking, but he had a lot to say about the free market, about people being able to choose and find the best path that's right for them. Now you might think, well, that's pretty obvious. Okay, of course we're free to choose. But what's he talking about? He's talking about that system in relation to those systems that were controlled by governments as, from a centralized standpoint. We're talking mostly about those former Soviet bloc countries, those Eastern bloc countries, in which those countries had very definite uh, rigid government control of the economy, where they infamously had things like five-year plans where they would sketch out the amount of production of everything, the amount of number of refrigerators, tubes of toothpaste, uh, you name it, it just it went to excruciating detail. And that system didn't really work very well because it was just simply too hard to measure what people's demands were going to be. And it's better to let the market work itself out, even though it's not perfect. And I want to make clear that even though the free market system is, I think, observably uh, uh, better, superior to the command economy, it's far from perfect. And we have issues that we need to address, which is why we need government to protect consumers, because you know what's to stop producers from making defective products and not really caring? Well, we have a system that prevents them from doing that. And when they do that, then they get penalized and that protects all of us. That's good for us. And we, we want that sort of thing. So free doesn't mean free to create dangerous products. It also doesn't mean you're free to uh, go steal your neighbor's TV, uh, right? Doesn't mean that's not going to happen, but uh, we have laws in place to try to protect against that. Um, and so there are problems with free markets. They sometimes do get excesses, and we've certainly seen that. Uh, if you've been following the news at all, it's probably, you probably have found it difficult to not hear something about the cryptocurrencies and whatnot, and uh, how one of the particular crypto exchanges has gone under, and the, the founder is uh, under indictment and uh, whatnot. And that's an example, really, of, one of the excesses of an unregulated marketplace. And we're going to talk about the value of having some government involvement. But that doesn't mean government deciding every single decision. We still have the opportunity to make decisions within the constraints that government sets for us for really, frankly, our own good. It's like a basketball game that didn't have any referees. That would not be a particularly good game. That would be lots of fouling going on. And, and uh, you know, we get out of hand with it. So we don't want things to get out of hand. We want an orderly system, which is why we have our, our markets, which we define as an organized means. Keyword being organized means by which people exchange value. And that is when we talk about markets, and, and by the way, the term market can mean something big, it means something small, you can zoom in, zoom out when it comes to markets. But I think the thing that we should know about markets is that they're relatively organized. And that some markets, <clears throat> which by the way, are not a physical location often. In fact, as time goes by, we see lots of virtual markets, things like you know, the way we, we, we transact financial transactions. Most of us don't even go to the bank anymore. I haven't been in, in the bank for several months, right? And I used to work in, in a bank every day. And, and uh, if I were a banker today, I probably wouldn't see most of my customers. So markets are not physical places, but they are, they are organized. And because of that, they allow people to exchange value in a relatively orderly means. And we're going to talk about what supply and demand look like, and those are obviously the two sides of markets that we're all familiar with, you know, just in living life, we're familiar with what supply and demand are, but we'll give a little bit more of a concrete definition of how the interplay between demand and supply takes place. And so we talk about markets, we're talking about these very uh, distinct definitions, okay? All right, questions so far. I've only got about eh, six or seven minutes, so let me just real quickly here, um, I don't think I'll get through all of what I intended to get through today, but I'll get and I'll get close. This will be a pretty good jumping off point for when we come back next week. Uh, since we're just sort of talking about the who, what, when, where, why of econ, we'll just talk about the fact that econ has really got two branches. Um, and for those of you who are planning to maybe go to business school someday or, or some related uh, field, you'll probably take both of these classes at some point because we offer both of the introductory courses in microeconomics and in macroeconomics. And 
How do these differ? Well, they differ in terms of scope and size. We talk about the microeconomics, we're talking about the small picture view of the economy. We talk about macro, we're talking about a bigger picture view. Um, sometimes the one particular analogy that's been given is that uh, micro is the, the small picture view of the economy or the, or I'm sorry, the street level view of the economy. Street level view. That, that one metaphor is that if you walk on the street, you see individual firms selling individual goods at individual prices. And this term individual comes up again and again. And it's, it's often been likened to where we live on the street level. That is, we go to work and we're earning a wage. We turn those wages into spending throughout the economy. And these are the daily interactions that we're in micro lives. But we're also part of a macro picture, whether we know it or not, because every time we buy something or we get paid or we pay taxes, we're sort of racking up the, the numbers for the entire economy uh, in some giant computer somewhere, right? Or many computers, but you were participating because we're all economic uh, actors. Unless we're totally off the grid, and I assume if you're on a Zoom call, you're not off the grid by definition. But that's what the difference is, is street level view versus the view from outer space, which is the big picture view of the economy, including the global economy, because we do talk a lot about the global economy. We're going to get into a lot of issues concerning global economics, um, because it really is a, an important uh, thing for us to be talking about here when we talk about um, uh, econ as a social science, which I do want to maintain the focus. Micro, you could simply sum up and say, it's the study of markets. I think that's probably a fairly good definition that we sort of slice into individual parts of the economy. If we're talking about the auto industry, we're not worried about the aerospace industry or telecommunications. We're only interested in the auto industry so we can slice into that and look at what's going on. Whereas with macroeconomics, we're studying the entire thing. And macro involves very large variables at times, much larger than what you'd even find in, in micro. Some of the subfields that go within this, and I, I know that most people here will not enter econ as a profession if, if you're an average class. It's not a very large profession, but nonetheless, it's probably important to know what economists are up to. And I've got a slide that follows that I'll pick up on next time by talking about what economists do. But among these, they specialize often in these subfields like labor economics. We'll, we'll talk plenty about labor and wages in this class. Industrial organization, if you take a micro course, you learn a lot about how um, industries, which are the ecosystems that businesses operate, differ from one another and why. You'll get into that. Information economics, which is what I mentioned, this idea of imperfect information. Financial economics which is very much related to monetary economics. Um, and industrial regulation, which we will talk a bit about. Those are subfields of micro. Within macro, we're going to talk some about monetary economics. We will get into that. Um, toward the end of the class, I think around week eight or nine, we'll talk a bit more about monetarism, uh, monetary, monetary thinking, uh, monetary policy from a government standpoint. And by the way, whenever in macroeconomics we use the word policy, we're almost always talking about government policy, almost always. Trade studies that is international trade, business cycles, we'll talk a bit about business cycles and what to do about the ups and downs of business cycles themselves, okay? I guess again, about four minutes. I can just roughly cover this and then we'll be really right on track with where we need to be. If we come back next time, I'll start to talk about who's who and what's what. That is because two branches. And, uh, oops, wait a minute. I'm not because two. It's what do economists do? Sorry about that. What do economists do? If I can get my thing to advance here, which, there we go, good Lord. A mouse is kind of effective here. So what do economists do? They do a lot of things, and I'll let you read most of this on your own. Teaching your research, and there are a lot of opportunities, first of all, even though it's a fairly small occupation, um, there are lots of opportunities for those of you who are who like econ, and some do, and, and I will, I'm not so naive as to think that everybody loves econ the way those of us who have been in our profession do, but you know, I, I understand that. We're sort of like the dentist. Not everybody likes to go to the dentist, and there are people who like to go to the dentist. And it, we're all different, but uh, it's a small occupation with lots of opportunity. If you decide that you like econ, teaching and research is what, like what I do. I also run my own business, and so I've got both of those covered. A lot of the work in government, 
They provide consulting both to political leaders as well as to corporate uh, heads. And so as a result, they are often involved in that. And then they make statements that are important to note. And this is gonna be a jumping off point next time. We're gonna talk about the difference between positive and normative statements. And that's a good place for us to stop right here because we're gonna talk about what the differences are between these two kinds of statements, positive statements and normative statements, because this one in particular, normative statements deals with economic policy and what should be done. The word should is very critical to this definition, okay? So that's a good place for us to stop. Um, does anybody have any questions for me? Um, uh, feel free to hit, enter something in the chat box if you do, or you can speak up. There's, we're a small, I think there are only eight of us on this particular call. I will post the link to this uh, a bit later um, in the Brightspace site under this week one. And I won't do that on a routine basis, but given the fact that it's the first week, we've got a couple of people who are not yet registered. I don't want them to not have the availability of this particular lecture. But can I answer any questions uh, for anybody before we get going? Okay, well, go ahead and make sure that you, um, let me see here, I've got somebody with chat box, bear with me here. I do not know what is wrong with this, this mouse on my computer. Let me see if I can. Okay, all right, that's fine. So thanks to you too. Um, all right, so make sure you participate in the discussion. Um, and let me say hi and check out the welcome introduction uh, tab and, uh, and I'll look for you in the discussions. If you have any questions about anything in the meantime, feel free to get with me, just send me an email or call me, whichever you prefer, and I'm more than happy to help you. So uh, I look forward to working with you all this semester. And uh, for now, we'll say, uh, we'll say goodbye and have a great weekend and I'll see you next time.